Hi everyone, welcome to my channel, and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. Let's visit the small and picturesque town of Griffin, located in the state of Georgia in the southeastern United States of America. Rightfully considered one of Georgia's oldest towns, Griffin was founded in 1840 and has since played a significant role in the state's history. All this influence of the past can be seen in its architecture and preserved monuments. The historical center of the town is imbued with the spirit of antiquity, where old brick buildings intertwine with modernity, its rich history, stunning architecture, beautiful parks, and a variety of flavors make it a true gem of the South in the United States. Today, our story is full of intrigue and unexpected twists of fate, at the end of which each of you will ask yourself one question. Where is the truth? Mary Catherine never thought that one careless act would lead to such terrible consequences. When the judge entered the courtroom, a special atmosphere of tension and anticipation appeared in the room. Everyone present focused and froze in anticipation of the verdict. The attorneys have done a tremendous amount of work, provided accurate arguments, and in case of an unexpected verdict, they already plan their performance and are ready for appeals and objections. The judge gives the floor to the jury and they announce their verdict. At the end of a week-long trial and a four-hour jury deliberation, Mary Catherine was found not guilty and acquitted on all charges. But let's return to this joyful note to the origins of the story and try to understand together what led the young woman to the defendant's bench and whether it could have been prevented. Stephen Andrew Freeman was born on January 1, 1995, in Thomaston, Georgia, to Troy and Jennifer Freeman. He and his brother Blake grew up as happy, healthy children, without any problems with their parents or society. Kind and responsive, Stephen had many friends. Everyone described him as an exceptionally calm and balanced person. Stephen grew up in Griffin, where he later attended Spalding High School and Gordon State College to complete his education. Mary Catherine Higdon was also raised in a respectable family, somewhat carefree, impetuous, humorous, friendly. She was drawn to creativity. She often put on mini plays and performed them in front of her family and neighbors. Mary and Stephen fell in love with each other in their senior years and have been inseparable since. The young couple had a lot of common interests. Both loved being in nature. They went hiking, fishing, and even hunting together. In 2012, Stephen Freeman updated his Facebook status to say he was in a relationship and regularly posted various photos with his beloved. Mary's family was fond of her boyfriend. Steve's parents, in turn, also accepted his girlfriend as their own daughter. After graduating from school, the young people moved in together. Stephen got a job as a plumber at Drainwright Gutters and Roofing Inc., and Mary Catherine worked as a teacher's assistant at St. George's Episcopal School. She also worked part-time as a salesperson at a gun store. By the summer of 2018, Stephen and Mary had been living together for seven years, but had not gotten married. On August 1, 2018, at 10.42 p.m., emergency services received an alarm call. The caller, 24-year-old Mary Catherine Higdon, screamed hysterically into the phone that she had accidentally shot her boyfriend. She reported grabbing a Glock 43 firearm, unaware that there was a bullet in the chamber. When paramedics and police arrived at Sunnybrook Drive, the girl was in a state of shock. She knelt in front of the motionless and bloodied body of the young man lying on the bed, crying incessantly, gasping and begging the doctors to help him. I can't lose him. I can't lose him, she cried hoarsely. Law enforcement officers struggled to pull Mary Catherine away from the victim to examine him and provide first aid. 23-year-old Stephen Freeman, wounded in the chest just below the neck, was still breathing. He was immediately transported to Spalding Regional Hospital. Unfortunately, a few minutes before midnight, the young man's heart stopped. Not fully comprehending the tragedy that had occurred, and still in shock, Mary had to visit the police station to give her account of the events. She was called in for questioning, where the girl, still completely stunned, claimed that the shot was accidental. She explained that there had always been firearms in their home, 
and that Stephen would leave a pistol on the nightstand for self-defense before going to sleep, as their house was located outside the city. On that fateful evening, she merely wanted to hand Stephen the pistol, and it accidentally discharged. She had no idea the gun was loaded. Mary Catherine insisted that Stephen Freeman was the love of her life. She would never harm him, especially not intentionally. Examining the scene, investigators did not rule out the possibility that the act might have been premeditated, and they had substantial arguments to support this theory. There were signs of a struggle in the kitchen, with food and dishes scattered about. Detectives Adam Trammell and Chris Wilson found Mary's story improbable and continued the investigation, examining the evidence. Mary Catherine was called in for a second interrogation, where the investigators employed pressure tactics. They yelled at the suspect, expressed disbelief in her story, and demanded the truth. It worked. Mary Catherine confessed to shooting her boyfriend in anger. She shared that they had a severe argument, and she wanted to leave him. Having recorded the conversation, the investigators had an admission of guilt, indicating a case solved with a heartfelt confession. However, a serious technical problem arose, causing most of the recording to be lost, save for interference and indistinct noises. How this happened was unexplainable, as was the reason why no one thought to make a backup copy of this crucial piece of evidence. Further investigation revealed that the pistol could not have fired accidentally, as it required a trigger pull. Moreover, for the bullet to hit Stephen as it did, the pistol had to be pointed at the victim. Detectives also questioned Mary's behavior. Some suspected she was overacting, demonstrating her distress in an exaggerated manner. The detectives didn't stop for a moment, piecing together their version of the tragedy with new evidence and proof. Another critical fact cast doubt on the accident and Mary Catherine's words. Investigators learned that the girl worked at a gun store, where employees undergo thorough training on handling various firearms before starting work. This meant she undoubtedly knew how to safely hand over a pistol without causing harm. The picture of an accident didn't align with the new facts that the investigation uncovered. The woman changed her statement several times. Sometimes her hysterical state interrupted the interrogation, but she reiterated time and again that it was an accident. However, in another conversation, Mary Catherine let slip to the police that at Stephen's request, she tossed the pistol to hand it to him, and the weapon accidentally discharged. This didn't match what she told investigators at the scene and during the first interrogation. Back then, Mary repeatedly stated that she was simply handing Stephen the pistol hand to hand, not tossing it, and that's when it accidentally fired below his neck. These changing statements worked against Mary Catherine, as she was caught lying, and every word was scrutinized for hidden intent, indicating guilt concealment. Mary was detained and remained in Spalding County Jail during the trial. She was charged with felony murder, malice murder, aggravated assault, and possession of a firearm during the commission of a crime. Lieutenant Wilson vehemently contested Mary's claim of it being an accident and tried to prove her guilt in a deliberate and meticulously planned act. A new piece of evidence in this case was common cooking grease found on the slide of the pistol. The slide also had lubricant, suggesting that at some point, the magazine must have been emptied. Bullets were loaded, inserted back into the pistol and placed on a shelf. In her defense, Mary Catherine told the police that she indeed was preparing dinner for Stephen that evening, the very dinner that was found scattered on the kitchen floor, explaining the presence of grease on the slide. Subsequent interrogations of the couple's relatives and friends did not provide the clarity expected in this case. Many friends claimed that this teenage love turned into a roller coaster ride for Stephen and Mary until the very end. Their relationship, at times nearly ending, then reigniting with new passion, became genuinely complicated in recent years. The lovers often quarreled over emerging disagreements. Mary turned every argument into a drama. She screamed at Stephen and attacked him, after which he often left the house to spend the night with friends, turning off his phone as Mary continued to call and text him. She tried to control his every move, driving Stephen to frustration. The guy shared with friends that Mary, during arguments and fights, pointed the pistol at him or herself, threatening to end her life or his. 
Stephen never reported this to the police, fearing Mary would be jailed. And this was not the only instance when Mary resorted to using a weapon. And there were plenty of weapons in their home. During an interrogation, Stephen's friend Thomas Skinner shared that two days before the tragedy, on July 30th, 2018, Stephen and Mary Catherine exchanged warm messages, wishing each other a good day. The next day, July 31st, Stephen told his mother that he would not return home to that devil and stayed the night at Thomas's place. On August 1st, 2018, when Stephen didn't come home to sleep, Mary sent him hundreds of messages begging him to return. That evening, she prepared dinner and waited for her beloved. From Stephen's mother, she learned he was at his friend Thomas's place and went to pick him up. She encountered them on the road and, rolling down the window, shouted that she was waiting for him at home for dinner. Stephen replied that he was coming home. The evening, instead of a reconciliatory dinner, ended in tragedy. The police believed the case was closed as a premeditated act, driven by Mary Catherine's anger, but her defense team revealed another side to the young couple's life, known to few. On June 17, 2019, almost a year after Stephen's death, his beloved Mary Catherine Higdon stood trial. Before the hearing, Mary Higdon was offered a plea deal for life imprisonment with the possibility of parole if she pled guilty. However, she refused the deal, insisting she could never harm Stephen because he was the love of her life. At the initial hearings, Mary Higdon defended herself vehemently. She repeatedly claimed it was an accident and that she loved Stephen Freeman. She also surprised many by accusing her boyfriend of abusive behavior towards her. She claimed he hit her twice and even forced himself on her. On the day of the tragedy, he allegedly attacked her, and she had to defend herself. It turned out the couple's relationship had been deteriorating over some time. Friends and relatives claimed Mary Higdon was furious because Stephen often ignored her messages and calls. She demanded attention and pursued him, especially insistently lately. Allegedly, on the night of the act, when Stephen Freeman finally came home, he refused to eat the dinner Mary had prepared for him, which became the last straw for her. She couldn't hold back and fired at him. Prosecutor Kate Lenhard stated in court that there was physical evidence supporting that Mary Catherine shot Stephen in anger after he didn't come home for dinner and ignored her calls and text messages. As physical evidence, the grease found on the pistol and the sheet taken from the mattress where Stephen lay bleeding were presented. The sheet was shown as a key piece of evidence that Stephen was not attacking Mary, but was sitting still in one spot. Forensic experts examined the blood stains and determined that at the moment of the shot, Stephen was not moving or approaching Mary Catherine, but was calmly sitting on the bed. If he had been moving, blood would have been everywhere, not just in one corner of the sheet. This only confirmed that the accused's version was once again false. In court, faced directly with the possibility of life imprisonment and finally believing in what was happening, Mary Catherine took a risky decision to give truthful testimony in court. With tears in her eyes in front of the judge and numerous attendees, she once again portrayed Stephen Freeman as a harsh and controlling tyrant, and with certain evidence, she managed to do so. The defense stuck to the self-defense narrative, presenting the argument that erupted into a scandal between Mary and Stephen on the evening of the tragedy, where Mary fired at him in defense. Mary Catherine sorrowfully shared numerous stories from her life where Stephen had hurt her. She confessed he had repeatedly hit her face, shaken her, and threatened punishment for any minor misconduct or disobedience. Living with Stephen, I experienced all kinds of pressure imaginable. Verbal insults, physical attacks, and even assault. He constantly controlled and manipulated me. He needed to know where I was, who I was with, what I was doing, how I was spending money, and even what I was eating. He drove me to despair with unreasonable jealousy. I never reported him to the police because I loved and feared him. The defense presented ample evidence to support her claims, revealing not just text messages taken from Mary's old phone, but also a correspondence that raised significant questions about who was the real tyrant and betrayer in this relationship. 
The text messages, dating back over a year and a half between her and Stephen, not only proved the boy's harshness, but also the girl's infidelity. Some message snippets showed Stephen indeed insulting Mary Catherine with harsh words and threatening her with repercussions upon his return from fishing. However, the reason for his anger was much more disdainful. Stephen's friends confirmed that at that moment, he was indeed very angry with his girlfriend for being unfaithful, which Mary denied. Mary Catherine shared that Stephen had forced himself on her twice, and she feared he would hurt her again on August 1, 2018, leading her to act in self-defense. The defense called an expert and close relatives of Mary who could attest to the domestic violence. Mary's sister, Sarah Higdon, testified, affirmatively stating she saw bruises on Mary's arm two weeks before the shooting. She expressed regret for not photographing it and believing Mary's explanation that it happened accidentally. A tearful Mary Higdon explained to the jury that on that fateful night, she decided to break up with Stephen once and for all, telling him to leave the house. Stephen became angry and attacked her. In defense, she grabbed the pistol from the nightstand and accidentally fired. After Mary Catherine's emotional testimony, the prosecution and defense engaged in a fierce battle with Stephen's former friends, who had been close to Mary for years, desperately trying to idealize their deceased friend. Thomas Skinner, Stephen's best friend, described the victim as a loyal and hardworking country boy, and Mary Catherine as an obsessive and possessive girlfriend who constantly controlled and stalked him. He claimed Mary Catherine and Stephen's relationship had become toxic over the last few years, with her threatening to end her life whenever Stephen tried to leave her, and once, after an argument, she pointed a pistol at her head in front of him. Another witness, Stephen's co-worker Alicia Varela, testified that Mary Catherine obsessively called Stephen throughout the day, even when he was at work. However, in Mary's supposedly truthful court testimony, where she framed the shooting as self-defense, she missed an important detail that prosecutor Kate Lenhard pointed out. Mary talked a lot about their interactions and how, after many years of perfect relations, they suddenly started to degrade and physically abuse each other. But she never mentioned the moment of supposed self-defense when she actually pulled the trigger. Prosecutor Kate Lenhard was not convinced by such an admission, noting that in cross-examination, Mary never once mentioned any harsh treatment by Stephen. She repeatedly asked Mary Catherine whether a woman, being safe at home, would go after her assailant late at night to bring him back home. The answer was not convincing, and the prosecutor continued her statement, embodying that dreadful scene of the accidental shooting. Kate Lenhard picked up the pistol and recreated the moment as she saw it. According to her version, Stephen came home. Then, after hearing Mary out, they argued and he refused to have dinner. Mary, enraged, scattered the prepared food around the kitchen. Stephen, trying to avoid further conflict, went to the bedroom and sat on the bed. Likely he was waiting for her to calm down, but Mary, ready for confrontation, called out to him twice without receiving a response, walked into the bedroom, and shot him in the neck, on the left side, since he hadn't turned to face her. In her closing arguments, Kate Lenhard reminded the jury of the various stories and versions that kept changing at every police interrogation and court hearing. Mary Catherine Higdon spared no details in her emotional testimony about the alleged abuse from Stephen Freeman. But before handing the case over to the jury, Kate Lenhard desperately pleaded to consider this story not as a case of self-defense, but as a case of extreme manipulation. Despite the lost confession recording, the prosecution presented other evidence and counter-arguments. The forensic examination proved that Stephen Freeman was sitting on the bed at the moment of the shooting. Hence, he couldn't have been attacking Mary Higdon. Mary claimed they kept the gun in the house unloaded. Detectives suspected that the pistol was indeed loaded in advance on the evening of August 1, 2018, when Mary was preparing a roast for Stephen. This was the only explanation for how grease marks not only got on part of the slide but also inside the pistol. Had Mary Catherine really loaded the pistol in advance? Colleagues, neighbors, family, friends, 
and acquaintances of Stephen Freeman unanimously testified that he was not prone to aggression. Prosecutors also pointed out that Mary Catherine Higdon changed details of her story at least 10 times since the first interrogation, attributing such changes to fear. Mary Catherine refused a plea deal as she could have been facing the death penalty. The wait for the verdict felt like an eternity to her. After hearing all witnesses and the accused, the case was handed over to the jury. Just 10 minutes later, the jury was ready to announce their decision. However, two jurors out of 10 had doubts about some aspects of the prosecution's story. They were concerned that investigators, so eager to charge Mary Catherine with premeditated action, had not fully checked crucial facts. Questions were raised about the lack of a complete investigation into Stephen Freeman's phone, checking his text messages, and browsing history. The prosecution simply hadn't done this. Besides Mary's lies, no sufficient evidence was presented against her. The arguments presented by jurors Victor and Chris had an effect. The jury deliberated and returned a unanimous verdict, not guilty. A few hours later, Mary Catherine Higdon was free. After a lengthy deliberation, the 12 jurors concluded the following. On the first charge, malicious action, the defendant was found not guilty. On the second charge, serious action, the defendant was found not guilty. When the judge acquitted Mary Catherine Higdon on all charges, including intentional action, reckless action, assault with a deadly weapon, and carrying a weapon during the commission of a crime, many people in the courtroom were shocked. Watching the woman who took her son's life walk out of the courtroom, Jennifer Freeman could barely contain her anger towards the jurors. Everyone who supported Stephen's family was also stunned by such a verdict. After the trial ended in her favor, Mary Catherine returned home to be with her family in Griffin. Since then, she has stayed out of the limelight and is almost absent from social media, likely to avoid undue attention from the media and the public. Her Instagram profile is private, and no further details about her current whereabouts are known. It's assumed that Mary Catherine has moved on from her harrowing past to live a quiet and unnoticeable life. Stephen Freeman's mother dedicated a farewell post to her son on social media. Stephen lived a life filled with love, joy, compassion, and loyalty. Everyone was his friend, and those who enjoyed hunting and fishing with him were his closest. He had a heart of gold and a charming southern smile. Stephen showed his love for you by making you feel like you were the only person in the world, making you laugh until your stomach hurt, always smiling broadly, hugging you, and never leaving your side. These three simple words, I love you, have always inspired me. So who really pulled the trigger in this story? That's a question you must answer for yourself, as all the answers in this story are evident. By analyzing and presenting the situation, it's up to everyone to decide whether Mary Catherine is guilty or if it was a tragic accident that cost a young man his life. How much do you agree with the two jurors who changed the course of a young woman's life, giving her a second chance? Mary Catherine likely lives a quiet life away from the spotlight now that she has managed to leave her terrible past behind. Thanks for watching, guys. Subscribe to my channel. There are many shocking stories ahead of you.